turn back time and change things, would you? Yes. And I say that because before I went into incarceration, I had, like I said, a caring family. You know, we had our ups and downs well. There was people that I crossed paths with in, in my life that who contributed to my well-being. So it didn't really take incarceration. So if I could change that, yes. Some people, a lot of ex-felons feel like, well, I would change it. I'm scarred, I have an AIS number now. Um, I watched my daughter grow up in photos. So to a degree, yeah, there's a lot that I would change. Okay. Did you think about the possibilities of going to prison before actually going? The life that I was living, it always was in the back of my mind that if I keep going and racing at the pace that I'm racing, I will eventually either die or be given a lengthy sentence while confined. Okay. Was your life as a kid hard or was it all right? Like most youth, uh, I developed a talent of drawing around the age of first grade, I would say. Um, I'd say around the age of 12, I think my parents may have divorced. What really set me on the wrong track, I feel, was the fact that I was sodomized at the age of 10 by a neighbor and a relative on more than one account. And as a child, just experiencing that, it taught me how to pretend, to pretend that it didn't occur pretend that such a horrific act could never occur to me. And that's what it taught me to pretend, to pretend. So I went into a state of confusion, solitude. I would vacate to my bedroom. My parents and my sister and brother, they can testify to this. I spent numerous hours throughout the day to myself because I didn't know how to convey, convey that type of pain. And as the years progressed, I went from being an adolescent, I started entering my teenage years, and entering my teenage years placed me at middle school. And being at middle school put me around more energetic youth. So my silent treatment for is distancing myself from other people and harboring what I went through, I went to becoming an aggressive individual uh, to the extent that even PE, a subject that most students like, I failed PE because I felt you know, uncomfortable dressing out amongst the other boys. So it had an impact on me at the age of 10, 11. So how old were you when that trauma happened? About 10 years old, 11. And it also caused me to view myself and other people in somewhat of a negative manner. And as I stated, I went from being silent to being an aggressive individual as a means of preventing this from occurring again. If you could confront those predators, what would you say to them? You ever thought about that question? <laughs> yeah. I don't know what I would say. Something like that I couldn't plot and I couldn't plan. Uh, I know I would make it known is what type of impact it had on me. And the fact that I don't like how, you know, these two individuals may have moved on with their married lives, started their families, things of that nature, that I would, you know, make it known as to what I suffered. So these individuals are what, bisexual? As far as I know, they married, they married, married and, well, yeah. Or they married, rather. I got you. Who's your idol? I have none. There's a lot of people I admire. I mean, I went from admiring the guy on the corner to admiring people like my father, I gotta say that. You know, he had his good points and bad points, but a, a late bill never came to our house. Food was always in the house, lights was on. Uh, I admire people like my sister, I gotta say that, because even though she's two years younger than me, she done achieved a great deal. I just want her to stay focused. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let me follow up this way. I actually skipped this question. Do you believe in God? My outlook on God is different from most people. Okay. 
and talk to us about your outlook. I had the opportunity to go off into a little bit of Hebrew and Greek, and I come to find out that certain things we may understand in the English term not necessarily mean this in the Hebrew or Greek. And I'm one of those individuals that I wrestled for for many years, you know, in regards to this God. And what I saw for is with the ministers that I watched when as I was coming up, the image that they portrayed, the vibes that I got from them, I didn't put them in the category and say, okay, well, I've seen God because I've seen him, you know, his, his works through these individuals. Right. In other words, I had developed a outlook on God that God had died or God is dead. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I say that because through my research and my experiences, my experiences to me outweighed the Bible. Mm -hmm. And although I had a grandmother who prayed, sister who prayed, uh, mother who's, who prayed, I just couldn't grasp that that they was giving to me in regards to the Bible. So for, for many years and even now, I have my doubts, I question, because I'm one of those type of individuals, I'm convinced that in spite of who you believe, life consists of the effort that you put in, whether you put forth effort or you don't. And I'm not one of those that sing hymns and pray and just hope. I'm one of those that activate what I know. But it's, it's always room to learn because if you take an individual who is blind, mm -hmm. who can't see, and this individual says he hears automobiles, mm -hmm. he admires the sound, he hears children chirping and laughing, he hears their feet beating across the grass because they're leaping and skipping or whatever. And then he smells different uh, scents in the air in regards to what's being cooked. But now let's say this individual's eyes is open. There's still a, a world that he hasn't seen. Although he now sees the automobiles that he once admired their sound, he see these happy children, and he see this, this dish sitting on the table. Even though he now sees this, there's still a big world that he hasn't seen. And that's even when you're dealing with what some people refer to as religion. Yeah, you may have been enlightened a certain thing, but there's still certain things in life that we don't know. And I feel like we're still learning about the so-called, you know, just the whole God issue. I feel like we still learn. And I'm one of them people that I believe that truth is eternal. We haven't come to a point where we have grasped the whole truth. Okay. We have absolutely arrived. I feel like truth is an ongoing thing. And we as human beings got to be ongoing in our research. At one, at one point, we thought that the earth was flat. But doing research and questioning, we come to find out that this earth is actually round. And for many years, we thought that the sun arose and the sun descended. Mm -hmm. But through our research, questioning, dissecting, we come to find out that the earth revolves around the sun. Right. So I'm convinced that through our research and questioning, that's how we're going to gain revelation as to whether or not he exists. That's just me. Okay. Part one of this, because we're going to do part two in just a second. All right, we're going to pick up the part two of this interview with perspective from a reformer. And we left off with this question that talks about, does it get lonely when you're um, actually incarcerated? It does, because there's very few people that you can relate to. And I say that because I was getting to a point where it's, you know, the staying up late at night, trading war stories with guys, all that got old. And that's what a lot of guys have a tendency to do. A lot of guys neglect the opportunity to get their GED and other substance abuse program because they'd rather stay up all night and, you know, just shoot the breeze with their homeboys. But I was had arrived to a point in life where I saw myself approaching society more and I wanted to regroup. And when you look at the word information, based on what you read, type information that you're gathering on the inside, I-N, that's when I started gaining formation in my life. So the question was, what was I taking in that helped me develop formation in my life? And a lot of time that was the information that I was gathering. Spiritual texts, substance abuse programs, the fact that I got my GED. This is what ignited a, sp a spark in me 
you know, to, to push for higher learning. Wonderful. Were there games in there? In Alabama, you have guys that try to depict themselves as Crips, Bloods, Disciples, but it's more of an area code as to what city you're from or who you know or whatever. First incident that I saw when I was at Limestone back in 98, was an uh, inmate's box was broken into while we was in breakfast. And when we came out, there was a lot of finger pointing as to who was responsible. And uh, they accused the guy from Montgomery of being the box breaker, and that kind of led to an incident. But the accuser was a Caucasian guy, and the guy who was supposedly the perpetrator was African American. So in that sense, it became a racial issue and not an area code issue. The guy got stabbed that morning, and uh, you would think that these inmates will, you know, be focused on getting back to bed, getting their sleep before we checked out on the chain gang, because I experienced the chain gang. Mm -hmm. But violence was in the air. Mm -hmm. He got stabbed that morning. Were there a lot of racism? For a lot of it. Most of it is suppressed. Most of it is guys who want to be with a segregated group, but you have very few that are serious about it. But then you have a multitude of guys just looking for a place to fit in, in right. inside. Gotcha. Is prison hard for someone who is, that is his first time there? If a first timer comes to prison, is it difficult for him or? I would say it is, but it just depends on the person and your perception. Like I said, my perception was not rolling in an entourage with a whole bunch of inmates trying to intimidate other inmates. I'm one of those type dudes that you know, I, I did a lot of artwork. Artwork for me was therapeutic. And then as I said, I started, you know, learning about myself, doing my little research, uh, just trying to learn. And it got to a point where I could count on one hand at each institution how many guys I dealt with. Mm -hmm. And I must admit, I hated being confined. And when you hate something, you don't become a part of it. Mm -hmm. So while other inmates were overindulging in the weight pile or board games or TV, I was somewhere doing something constructive. Gotcha. All right. Are there a lot of people with good intentions there? No. No. Okay. Why? It's just like society. I mean, I just got out of prison. I put in application with Walmart, Lowe's, Home Depot, Office Depot, and Nobody's really willing to give you that chance. I mean, it's all everybody for self. Whereas in prison, it's the same way. Everybody's out for self. Nobody wants to give you a chance. You have a um, few officials, and you have a select few inmates that really want what's better. But um, it really just depends on it. It's a few, huh? Right, select few. Gotcha. All right. So why is it so difficult for someone in prison to open up? Dealing with myself, mm -hmm. we live in a world where everybody don't create an atmosphere for you to open up. Mm -hmm. People are not willing to listen. You see the selfishness of other individuals and when you see that, you're not welcome. You're not invited to come and share what you're going through. So a person has to first create an, uh, an environment for somebody to come and convey, well, look, this is what I'm going through. And a lot of cases in prison, that would lead to guys just going off the deep end, just going off. Mm -hmm. And one reason why is because, you know, and also in prison you have some substance abuse program where you're told, well, I'm an addict. That's all you see yourself as, as an addict. Well, I'm an alcoholic. That's all you see yourself as. And when you start believing that, there's no, why would somebody want to listen to me? Mm -hmm. And a lot of guys carry that attitude, but, uh, what kept me afloat was I understand that because I lived a certain way don't mean that someone else did. And I always keep in mind that the reason why this individual is the way he is because something he went through. I may not know in detail as the way he went through, but the way he just handled that issue lets me know that based on the information that he had, based on what he know, that's why he addressed that issue in the manner that he did. So, you know, I, I just be reluctant, man, not to just shoot down on people. Why, why are you not talking? Why are you not opening up? Right. Some people haven't been taught to open up right. based on what they went through. Okay. 
Why now do you think about life when you had life before? Excuse me? Why do you think about life now when you had life before being incarcerated? Why is life important to you now? It's important because I have obligations. Um, I can do better than what I've done in the past. Um, I understand a lot more. But today I just live a simple life. I work out when I get a chance. Part-time job that I have, I do that. Then I try to carry my load with my sister, whatever, you know, help her around the house. Uh, shop when I can for what we need in the house. Just a simple life. And that's basically what life is. Life is simple. When we start trying to add all this recreational activities and all these, you know, materialistic things, and all, that's what makes life complicated, but it's simple. That's where I am now. I lead a simple life. Okay. Wonderful. All right. Is it a bad idea to ask if you ever have nightmares or remorse? Do I? Mm-hmm. You asking, is it a bad thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, no, it's not a bad thing, but it can happen. Because what we go through physically have an impact on us mentally. Mm -hmm. And when we lay down, we are somewhat <clears throat> not necessarily unconscious, mm -hmm. but our awareness is down. And sometimes when you experience certain things physically, I've known people to be robbed. And seven, eight years later, you know, they may wake up in a cold sweat mm -hmm. thinking about that incident. So what I went through in prison, the deaths that I saw, stabbing that I saw, the abuse, um, even the good that I've gained. Periodically it all come back to me every now and then. The no dreams, man. sometimes. But it's not to a point where it's, it's haunting me. It's not on that level, just something that I've experienced. I may dream and it may just come back to me, a vision or whatnot, but not to a point where it's haunting me or disrupting my current life. While incarcerated, what was the most important thing you lost? Your freedom to make choices when you was ready. Why so? You're not able to make decisions for yourself when you get ready. I mean, that's that in itself is a headache because I had dreams when I was incarcerated. But due to the fact that I was physically confined, all my dreams were confined as well because when you start trying to manifest a goal, a dream, it takes you to some degree playing a physical role, an active role in it. So due to the fact that I was confined physically, my dreams, hopes, everything was incarcerated. So now I just look back and I I'm thankful that I'm able now to start mobilizing some of the things that have been on my mind for many years. What was the most troubling thing that happened in the prison atmosphere for you? The single hand most troubling thing? Being set off a of parole. <laughs> when I thought I was going home the first two times and they I mean, what else? Because I've adjusted the violence. It's, and, you know, you expect it. You live through that. Um, now I've been in institutions where we had to bathe in cold water. I've seen guys take buckets, you know, cups or whatever, heat them up in the microwave. Because in prison, you know, we have microwave foods such as popcorn, hamburgers, hot dogs. And I've seen guys warm up water, pour them in garbage cans or mop buckets as a means of base. That didn't have an impact on me. I've seen the violence, but when they set me off for parole the first two times, that's that's the hardest thing that uh, I had to deal with at that time. Because the first time they set me off for two years, August of 05. Second time they set me off for six months, January of 08. And I was paroled out <laughs> October of 08. Did so, they give you a reason? I played a role um, to some degree, accumulating disciplinaries. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the second time, it was a, a matter of them just seeing whether or not 
fact that I wouldn't get disciplinary of the paperwork? Was that something that, had, you know, I was really, you know, changing or becoming more level-headed or was I just, you know, playing a front just to get a parole date? And how sure are you that those bad years before prison are behind you? Bad years before I went in? Mm -hmm. I know because I've been put in certain situations while released, and I know had I been put in the same situation before I went in prison, I would have reacted in a different manner. I mean, just dealing with the job. I mean, they, I was released 2008 in October. I see the condition that the economy is in. I have 19 applications out there right now, and the only person that gave me an opportunity, a chance, was Lawrence Keener from Power Move, his wife Winston. But other than that, I have 19 applications. That alone is enough for the average, you know, ex-felon. You know, just I'm just gonna give it up. Society's not giving me a chance. Why should I try to do anything? And most guys use that as an excuse to re-enter the criminal lifestyle. But me, the information that I gather, where I can find that that my mother, father, grandmother instilled in me as a child took root, and it began to, you know, flourish or whatever. So I'm applying things that I should have applied even before I went into prison because I knew better. But there were certain issues in my childhood that I didn't address. Mm -hmm. And I'm, 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 a, I'm, a, I'm a believer that when you face with an obligation or issue or whatever, you don't address it, it's going to address you later. So let's, let's play psychology. But go back to childhood. Mm -hmm. What was the core of your issues? What happened that made you want to revoke? People not understanding me. I felt like people didn't understand me. Um, I don't want to make this whole issue about being sodomized because that wasn't the only thing that played a role only in my rebellion. Factor, right? Exactly. But it was my perception of life, etc. Research shows that by the age of six, you develop a personality. So at six years old, before that trauma happened to you, were, were you able to say my mom and dad could have been more sensitive, they could have been more aware, or they were very protective and they were very sensitive? What role did they play in your development as a person? They were, um, they were balanced, I would say. And like I said, like most homes, you know, you have your argument between your parents or whatever. Uh, your punishment, you got your weapons or whatever, but it was a balance. Mm -hmm. And these people, my parents trusted me in the care of her sister, my mother's sister, mm -hmm. and this occurred. Whereas with the neighbor, trusted people. And that's really, you know, when you're dealing with statistics in regards to people being, or children being sodomized, it's by people that they know. Mm -hmm. Very rare when you have somebody that come from, you know, now it's, it's a widespread issue with you know strangers coming in or whatever and abducting children, but most children that are sodomized, molested by a babysitter, an older relative, a neighbor, it's by people that they know. So I can't fault my parents saying, "Well, y'all should have caught this," sure. because it occurred in the homes of people that they trust, mm -hmm. people who had morals and values and principles. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. All right, last one. How do you find fulfillment now? What fulfills you? Being balanced mentally, spiritually, emotionally, and financially. You have an identity in all four aspects. You have an identity for as your mental, what level you on, spiritual, what level you on, physically, and financially. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm seeking. I mean, I'm free physically. I'm in my right mind 12 and a half years later. Some people have talked with me and said, I can't depict you doing 12 and a half years until I show, well, this is my paperwork. I was in the ANA group about three weeks ago and they didn't believe it. But just so happened by me, you know, just being released, I had all my paperwork with me and I showed it to them. So I'm mentally balanced, emotionally, spiritually. Now I'm just seeking to gain strength. Well, one minute left. So for those people who care for you, family members, what do they pray for? For you to stay on the path that you're on? To not give up, succeed. That's been what everybody's been telling me since I've been out. Don't don't give up. You will succeed. Do you Things believe those? Do you believe that advice, or do you doubt yes. it? Yes. 
I, I really believe it. And it may go, it's, it may happen when I least expect it. But I know I had the resources to make it happen. And that's what I'm doing, applying myself. Wonderful.